and director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies. We're very pleased you could be with us today. We do a lot of things at ICJS. Uh, we have the archaeology department, getting word at the library, the papers, and our history department. But one of the most important things we do is we have fellows who join us and we sponsor events like this where we can talk to scholars from throughout the country and throughout the world about various various topics. Uh, we are running a four part book event this year, and this will be the second of those experiences. So we hope you will continue to join us for the rest of the year for our book events. But now it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Derek Spires, who is joining us from Cornell on a topic that is extremely important. The issue of citizenship is suddenly back in the news. What does it mean to be a citizen? And, and how have we developed the idea of citizenship? Um, it's obviously being developed in the early republic. And that is the topic of Professor Spire's first book, The Practice of Citizenship. He writes, grounded in political participation, mutual aid, critique, and revolution, and the myriad daily interactions between people living in the same spaces, citizenship, they, black writers, argued, is not defined by who one is, but rather by what one does. Obviously a very important topic, not only historically, but today. So he's looking particularly at the role of black writers uh, in early America, their agency and their role in resistance. Now, as I said, Derek is joining us from the uh, English department as well as the American Studies department at Cornell. He studies African American history, citizenship, public discourse, and the press, and especially the issue of African American intellectual history. The practice of citizenship has won a whole series of awards the Modern Language Association Prize, the Bibliographical Society in St. Louis Mercantile Liberty Prize, the MMLA Book Prize. So we're very pleased, and I hope you will join me in welcoming, welcoming Derek Spires. Afternoon. Nice to have an audience in the South. You know the protocol. Um, thanks, John, for that introduction, for inviting me, and thanks to the team at the center, at really me, team, squad of folks, um, for the support for this event and for all of you being here present and virtually. Um, there we go. Looking forward to meeting and talking to you all at the reception to follow and the book signing. Um, so in 1840, Samuel Ringo Ward told a white ally who questioned the urgency of organizing the first black state convention in New York, quote, had you a colored skin from October 1817 to June 1840, as I have in the pseudo republic, you would have seen through a very different medium. What does it mean to see and do citizenship through a different medium, one that privileges access and black agency over white conflict? In context, Ward was a part of a collective of black New Yorkers organizing to remove the state's $250 property qualification for black male suffrage. Nathaniel P. Rogers, the white editor of the National Anti-Slavery Standard and many other prominent white activists argued against this kind of organizing, except Rogers argued quote, where the clearest necessity demands it. In other words, voting rights, access to education, and equal employment, and the other rights and privileges of citizenship were not the clearest necessity. At its core, the practice of citizenship is about the questions and methodologies that emerge when we focus our attention on the concerns Black writers made foremost and on understanding these concerns in the terms they set forth. What do we learn when we take Black citizens as citizens? thinking seriously about and theorizing the meaning of citizenship in the United States. How do you articulate yourself as a citizen in a moment when the very definition of citizenship is in flux and each state has its own idiosyncratic way of defining who belongs and who doesn't? How do you do this work in a time not wholly unlike our own when states are in the process of stripping away the rights associated with citizenship like voting, rights that you have had access to for at least a generation? In the spirit of listening to early 19th century black intellectuals, the practice of citizenship tells a story about how black writers theorized and practiced citizenship in the early United States through a robust print culture. 
It insists on exploring citizenship, not just from the perspective of the law and its framing of black people and others, but also from the perspective of black Americans, not as objects of law or passive oppressed bodies, but rather as people consistently looking for ways to create new life and new possibilities. As state policies and public discourse around citizenship were becoming more racially restrictive, black activists across the early 19th century articulated an expansive theory of citizenship as a set of common practices, political participation, neighborliness, critique and revolution, and the myriad daily interactions between people living in the same spaces, both physically and virtually. From Absalom Jones and Richard Allen's founding of the Free African Society in 1787, through Francis E.W. Harper's writing about Maroonage and revolutionary violence in the Anglo-African magazine on the eve of the Civil War, Black organizers defined citizenship as a form of birthright, as Martha S. Jones has brilliantly detailed, and also as a form of collectivity developed by engaging in the process of creating and maintaining community, whether that were to define a state, nation, or other structure. Citizenship, they argue, is not a thing determined by who one is, but whether what but rather by what one does. It is at best not a private property to be held in stasis, but a public resource to be deployed and distributed collectively. The book draws its ethos from a few sources. Most prominently, Francis Smith Foster's deceptively simple assertion that, quote, once upon a time, long ago in North America, illiterate people of African descent lived and promulgated their own print culture. They did this primarily to speak to and for themselves about matters they considered worthy of written words. The other is Dorothy Porter's foundational 1945 bibliographic essay on black print. Quote, one may attach some significance to the fact that almost the very earliest imprints of Negro writing in this country were declarations or appeals in the cause of freedom. The Negro, like his white master, and indeed his white brothers, also desired and thought of freedom, end quote. If their essays were Baptist sermons, they might read something like, think it not strange that an oppressed people or any people would turn to print to declare for freedom. Think it not strange that these same people would turn to the same technology to express the beautiful, the pleasurable, the sublime, the mundane, and the spiritual. Think it not strange that a collective whose enslavement provided one of the revolution's key metaphors would also be the foremost philosophers of freedom and Republican governance. Indeed, a perusal of Porter's 1971 anthology, Early Negro Writing, reveals a collection of pamphlets, addresses, and petitions printed between 1760 and 1837 that begin fathers, brethren, and fellow citizen, or simply citizens. These addresses simultaneously celebrated milestones in the abolitionist cause and called on the nation to pair outright abolition with equal rights for black citizens. These invocations of fellow citizens were not rhetorical. Absalom Jones' 1799 petition to the president, Senate, and House of Representatives, for instance, claimed citizenship for his fellow petitioners, including enslaved people. Quote, believing them to be objects of your representation in your public councils in common with ourselves and every other class of citizens within the jurisdiction of the United States. But Jones and his fellow signatories were not merely objects of representation. Rather, they were included in the constitutions, we the people of the United States, and as such were not outsiders asking for inclusion in the body politic or for a special dispensation. Black citizens, including enslaved people, were guardians of our rights and patriots of equal and national liberties. Jones and the 73 other petition signers in addressing the state were participating in shaping the contours of a concept and legal framework that was and remains in flux. Invoking citizenship, not as a state granted status, but rather as grounds for shaping the state and a call to fellow citizens offered a powerful stance. Quote, forget not that you are native born American citizens and as such you are justly entitled to all the rights that are granted to the freest. Henry Holland Garnett proclaims this to his assumed audience of enslaved brethren nearly 50 years later in his address to the slaves of the United States in which he says, you have a right to strike. If your enslavers try to stop you, fight. I open with and often belabor the point of ubiquity, this stuff is everywhere 
because students and others, including myself as a graduate student, are often surprised, if not shocked, to learn that not only were Black organizers keen philosophers of citizenship, they were also citizens, as much as anyone could claim the title before the 14th Amendment. And the early history of the US citizenship from 1787 forward was one of consistently stripping away access to the rights associated with the citizenship that, as commenters from Abraham Lincoln to Roger Taney would take pains to point out, was not made especially for the colored race. That's Lincoln and Taney's language, not mine. Um, at the same time, Dorothy Porter's early work reminds us that many of the documents I'll talk about today and that made up my book have already been listed and collected in anthologies just waiting to be picked up. Indeed, most of the stuff I talk about, I came across in a library. I saw the distinctive black and white books in the Arno Press reprint series. I saw the distinctive red books that housed the color convention movement. My undergrad advisor told me to buy Dorothy Porter's book when I told him I couldn't find anything. He just said, here, do this. I bought it on Amazon, not hidden. The trick is to assume that there's a there there and go looking. It's a reading practice. The spirit of inquiry David Walker announced in his 1829 appeal to the colored citizens of the world and that writers like Francis Harper associated with what I describe in the book as critical citizenship. And I'd argue that more than the content of any given curriculum or book, it's this reading practice, this attunement to any version of humanity that isn't white Anglo-Saxon Protestant that attacks on things like AP English, AP African American studies and book bans are most invested in disrupting. But I digress. I joined recent work from historians Martha Jones, Chris Bonner and others in noting that citizenship talk was ubiquitous in black print. Black citizenship theorizing developed in the era of proliferating, overlapping, contradictory, improvisational definitions of citizenship from constitutional ratification through passage of the 14th Amendment. Like the Hebrew God confronting Ezekiel, they ask, can these dry bones live? And like Ezekiel, black intellectuals demonstrate a faith that the dry bones of Republican citizenship can indeed live. Citizenship, they argue, should enliven, not deaden, should provide a means for cultivating life, not a justification for taking it. We see this emphasis on citizenship as enlivening through the black pamphlet tradition from Benjamin Banneker's famous 1772 letter to then Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson to Hosea Easton's 1837 treatise on the intellectual character and civil and political condition of the colored people of the United States. Easton, a Congregationalist minister and activist in Massachusetts, framed citizenship as a commons essential to the functioning of any society and the livelihood of individuals in that society. Quote, a withholding of the enjoyment of any American principle from an American man, Easton asserts, either governmental, ecclesiastical, civil, social, or elemental, is in effect taking away his means of subsistence and consequently taking away his life. Easton posits citizenship as the process through which communities make meaning and distribute resources, material and immaterial, in a Republican government. Enclosing access to this commons, like enclosing access to water, arable land or an affirmative culture has very real material consequences, um, has very real material effects that make the perpetrator in Eastern's words, a murderer of the worst kind because such restrictions for current and potential citizens create the material inequalities that were paradoxically used to justify them. We take away your access to political self-determination or quality education and then we call the results of those restrictions essential racial traits. That's how race gets made, a spiral of slow death by political asphyxiation. We find an echo of Easton's logic in the state conventions Black New Yorkers held across the 1840s. For decades, Black activists in New York had been organizing to remove the $250 property requirement the state's 1821 constitution retained for Black men even as it removed property requirements for white men. These conventions fit within a, year, a near centuries long movement of state and national color conventions beginning in the 1830s and continuing until the turn of the 20th century. Thanks to the efforts from the Color Conventions Project, we now have access to well over 200 documents and growing from these conventions, including the 18 known statewide conventions held in New York State from 1840 to 1874. 
1840 Convention of Colored Inhabitants of the State of New York convened in Albany from August 18th to the 20th with approximately 140 delegates representing counties across the state. Building on a petition drive begun in the 1830s, the convention was organized to create auxiliary committees to facilitate a concerted petition drive. Quote, my brethren, delegates argue in their address to their colored fellow citizens. The possession of a franchise right is the lifeblood of political existence. It runs through all the convolutions of our civil state. It is strengthening in its effects and revivifying in its influences. To be deprived of it is like extracting the living principle from the blood of the system. You can tell that these folks were ministers, right? <laughs> and newspaper editors. Uh, participatory politics, including voting, functions as a channel connecting citizens in a political community, gathering and directing their collective civic energy. Preventing access to the franchise effectively isolates the disenfranchised, cutting the means to accumulating wealth, power and property, as well as their ability to contribute to the civic good. The Democrat majority in New York State supported racializing voting restrictions out of fears that black voting power could swing elections. A similar dynamic played out in Pennsylvania when after a contested election in 1837 and 38, the state passed a new constitution that restricted voting to white men. In other words, before 1838, black men could theoretically vote in the state of Pennsylvania. Yet justifications for these restrictions, they made these justifications through language that married political philosophy and white supremacy. Quote, that all men are free and equal, John G. Ross argued, applies to them only in a state of nature and not after the institution of civil government. In many states, and many rights flowing from a natural equality are necessarily abridged with a view to produce the greatest amount of security and happiness to the whole community. On this principle, the right of suffrage is extended to white men only. In contrast, delegates to black conventions argued that the state's policy had functioned to create the very racialized distinctions that Ross and others claimed were evidence of inherent inferiority. The franchises, black activists argued, an instrument of our elevation, not a gold or reward for it. Is it any wonder, they ask, that our energies have been relapsed, that our powers have been crippled, our purposes nerveless, our determinations dead and lifeless? From this outside repression, the convention tells its fellow colored citizens, proceed our degradation. This has been the source of our suffering and oppression, end quote. The cultural and political advances of the franchise open access to political and economic opportunities. Those resources of pecuniary and possessional emolument, which an unshackled citizenship does always ensure. And here you can see the resonances of people who were emancipated, formerly enslaved people, thinking through citizenship and the lack of citizenship, right? Black mission ganders would put the point even more forcefully during their 1843 state convention, quote, you have trampled upon our liberties in the dust and thus standing with the iron heel of oppression upon our heads, you bid us rise to a level with yourselves. And because we do not rise, you point the finger of scorn at, and contempt at us and say that we are an inferior race by nature." End quote. But there's something more basic to this argument than the belief in a specific mode of participatory politics like voting. And we lose something if we reduce participatory politics to just voting. Right? Even if franchised and disfranchised citizens do not share the common blood of suffrage, these intellectuals argue they do still share the basic human need for political self-determination, the need to expend political energy. Legislation cannot alter this need. As such, the convention further argues the will to participate in the state may dull due to disuse or disappear fragment or appear fragmented due to disorganization, but the energy itself never entirely disappears. It simply changes form. As the New York Convention's address to the voters of the state explains, quote, powers will have exercise, either healthy or unhealthy. The impartial and prescriptive non-suffrage act has been to us hurtful in the extreme. The powers that should naturally have been thus exercised were wrested from their legitimate enjoyment employment, excuse me, end quote. 
The convention's language echoes Alexander Hamilton's contention for a strong federal government in Federalist Number 13. Quote, civil power properly organized and exerted is capable of diffusing its force to a very great extent and can, in a manner, reproduce itself in every part of a great empire by a judicious arrangement of subordinate institutions, end quote. And I have to note that many of these writers and activists were either coming of age or active as Madison and Jefferson were publishing their papers, including the papers from the Constitutional Convention and the Federalist Papers were in circulation in newspapers. So they're getting this directly from the source material, citing and quoting. Um, where Hamilton's arguments focus on creating a federal government strong enough to direct a diverse and wide-ranging citizenry, the 1840 New York Convention warns that such a government must be capable to, of encompassing all of its citizens to be productive. If black citizens' Republican powers do not appear in evidence, it is not due to their absence. The 18 state conventions held over just 34 years put paid to the notion that black New Yorkers were unfit for a Republican government. Indeed, as I argue in the book, the act of convening was a very public performance of citizenship, an act of stagecraft as well as statecraft and black conveners were, clean, were keen to shape this public image. Undue and disproportionate development of powers produces unnatural effects, the convention argues. Unable to pursue happiness by means of political engagement, debate, compromise, and agitation, disfranchised citizens might eventually seek extra governmental and, extra, and eventually extra legal means. Like a gangrenous limb, the rock can and will spread to the rest of the community because despite the social boundaries, the root Republican principles that provide the community's foundation and facilitate exchanges between individuals will always be compromised. Moreover, the buildup of unfocused, unused power, like the buildup of water at a dam, could simply explode. What happens to a dream deferred, Langston Hughes would ask just over 100 years later. It's worth noting here that Hughes's maternal grandfather, Charles Henry Langston, and his brother, John Mercer, were leaders in the Ohio State's color conventions movement. They're direct connections. This tradition of thinking about participatory politics as a kind of circulating energy is one of the key threads running throughout the book. Picking up in 1787, as Absalom Jones and Richard Allen were founding the Free African Society in Philadelphia, within earshot of the debates around what would become the US Constitution. Richard Allen lived down the street from Alexander Hamilton. Um, and the book ends just before the Civil War with what I call the spirit of 1856, a renewed focus on anti-slavery violence as producing what Francis Harper called a new baptism of freedom. In my remaining time, I wanna offer a closer analysis of what I call critical citizenship through William J. Wilson's African American Picture Gallery. Critical citizens, I uh, argue, insist on historical complexity and interpretation, not as authoritatively explaining the present, but rather as a means for interrogating and revising the assumptions that make current social and political arrangements seem natural, timeless, and desirable. Critical citizens, Wilson's series suggests, take a stance that not only interrogates the content of US citizenship and its histories, but more importantly, challenges how citizenship and history are framed and how this framing and teaching in turn police what is sayable and knowable. Wilson's African American Picture Gallery series ran in the Anglo-African magazine, and I'm happy to talk more about this magazine. Again, you could buy this on eBay or Amazon.com, but don't raise the price. Keep it affordable, right? Um, it, it, the magazine was edited by Thomas Hamilton, and the series appeared in seven installments from February 1859 through October 1859. A longtime newspaper man, Hamilton founded the magazine with his brother Robert in 1859 as an outlet for the quote, 12 millions of blacks in the United States to a certain maintain their rank as men among men. No outside tongue, proclaims Hamilton, however gifted with eloquence, can tell their story. No outside eye, however penetrating, can see their wants. Hamilton's mission statement echoes similar proclamations in black periodicals from the first edition of Freedom's Journal in 1827, which opened with, we, we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us, end quote. Wilson's series within the magazine features a pseudonymous narrator named Ethiop, 
writing descriptions of at least 27 pictures that blend, that blend Afrofuturist meditations, cultural criticism, and the wit readers of black newspapers that come to expect from him. Wilson populates this gallery with images of Phyllis Wheatley, Mount Vernon, the Underground Railroad, the arrival of the first slave ship to Jamestown and others, through which Ethio contemplates, quote, what the people of color were, now are, and will yet be. Though these art objects often do not exist in the real world and the Anglo-African never illustrates them, so none of these objects actually exist. And even the ones that do exist, he revises them, right? Um, people in the world were familiar with folks like Wheatley and others enough to be able to imagine them. Completely fictionalized images, such as a portrait of Bill, a man who acted as an underground railroad agent while enslaved, enhanced the sense that Wilson's sketches were in fact meant to fill in the gaps in public visual arts in the hopes that artists might render them in full and that readers might participate in fleshing out the realities that galleries art objects depict. Sketching the series in this sense becomes not just about the objects on the page, but a, a method of collaborative critical inquiry, a print manifestation of critical citizenship. So from the first installment, Wilson's gallery signals its concern with art's production of historical understanding and how this understanding in turn shapes our experience. Wilson's first sketch takes up the slave ship and the first and the last colored editor. While the slave ship is on the gallery south side, the first and the last colored editor on the north, the narrative shift from the slave ship to the first and the last colored editor places before visitors the past, present, and future of the African-American picture gallery in a way suggestive of a conversation between them. So imagine someone ambling in an actual gallery seeing these images. As the gallery's first image in the series first sketch, the slave ship sets an agenda of turning the American mythos on its head through some of British North Americans, America's founding sites. Think of the sketch as a 19th century version of the 1619 project. Visitors encounter a large landscape painting in rather an unfavorable light offering a faithful image even to every shrub, crag, and nook of 17th century Jamestown Harbor. Featured prominently in the image are the slave ship, hideous to look upon as a slave ship ought to be, and a group of emaciated Africans, heavily manacled. Europeans themselves bring with them the wild savagery of Gothic America, symbolized not by a racialized dark wilderness or its indigenous inhabitants, but by a small boat carrying slaves from ship to shore with his satanic majesty gloating over the whole scene. So the entire scene recalls the sublime picturesque of J.M.W. Turner's 1840 landscape painting, The Slave Ship, and John Ruskin's famous description of it. Um, in Wilson's narrative, Ethiop maintains Ruskin's view of the guilty ship girded with condemnation, but where Ruskin's description blends the ship and the flailing bodies into his admiration of Turner's sublime seascape, in Wilson's gallery and Ethiop's meditations, the small ship, its human capital, and the moment of arrival remain in the foreground. So you can't quite see it well here, but in Turner's slave ship, you see the ship about to be wasted in the water, and you can see at the bottom small hands of enslaved people reaching up. And in the very corner, you can see, bottom right corner, you can see the devil or Jupiter or someone with the pitchfork. In Ethiopia's vision, Satan is up top, foreground. The ship is in the front, and we can see the enslaved people landing in Jamestown. Um, so in Wilson's gallery and Ethiopia's meditations, the small ship, its human capital, and the moment of arrival remain in the foreground. In other words, Wilson as Ethiop takes, not, takes up not only the memory of Jamestown, but also art criticism and depictions of the Middle Passage. With this introduction, the Gallery and Wilson series calls upon patrons to see enslavement as central to the nation's political and aesthetic history. Whether tragedy in Turner's The Slave Ship involves the spectacular mass murder of 133 enslaved Africans during the 1781 Zong Massacre, the tragedy in Wilson's The Slave Ship involves a mundane scene in the slave trade that would be repeated along the US coast for the next 250 years. The first and the last color editor, Ethiop's second sketch, positions black print culture as a countervailing center of gravity, a scene within the larger self-authored narrative of African America. 
In contrast to the looming image of the slave ship, this painting is a small but neat picture hanging on the north side of the gallery. In the painting, quite a young man sits at a desk piled with copies of previous black newspapers, from Freedom's Journal to Frederick Douglass's paper, while unperceived by the last editor, the first editor is looking intently on over his shoulder. So the first, the last, the first, the last editor first, so be last. The last editor is sitting at his desk doing his work. You can sort of imagine sort of hovering behind them this cast of characters who are maybe proofreading his work or maybe reading their own things and nodding. Um, it suggests this sort of intergenerational sense of responsibility and responsiveness. You can imagine someone like Samuel Cornish or Mary Ann Shack Carey right now looking over my shoulder. And in my office, I have a picture of Francis Harper there looking at me kind of judgmentally. Um, but it also points to a sort of tradition within the black press, a set of stylistic cues that you can see carried over intergenerationally. And it also suggests a collecting practice because the last editor has before him the newspaper somebody kept preserved and cataloged them, presumably. Shout out to the librarians in the house, even the emeritus ones. Um, as these first two paintings reveal, the African-American Picture Gallery, both space and sketch series, probes again and again the implications of which figures, images, and narratives we choose to represent citizenship. They also foreground how disrupting these narratives and these patterns in both art criti and criticism can help produce different citizenship practices. Ethiop articulates this principle explicitly for his Anglo-African readers um, through a portrait of Toussaint Louverture. While a portrait of George Washington, quote, recalls to mind the American Revolution and a portrait of Thomas Jefferson brings before the mind in all its scope and strength the Declaration of Independence, the Louverture portrait completes the thought and carries us forward to the times when the Declaration's broad and eternal principles will be fully recognized by and, apply, and applied to the entire American people. The portrait forces upon Ethiop's mind the whole history of Atlantic world revolutions, a history that invokes for him a future in which the Declaration might be fully realized, not as a product of a specifically European or white US revolution, but rather as a constitutive element of an ongoing hemispheric revolutionary process in which the successful slave rebellion in Haiti offers the key to the sublime idea of freedom. The positioning of the three revolutionaries creates a triptych, inviting visitors to fill in the empty spaces on the wall in a way that demands continued work. I want to reiterate that these images were not in the Anglo-African magazine, nor was Wilson necessarily citing actual paintings. They were all Wilson's fabrications. Wilson's series perhaps has an even stronger effect precisely because readers themselves are called upon to imagine the pictures in lieu of physical reference. Combined with Wilson's meditation on the pedagogical uses of art, we can read his interaction with these images as a primer for cultivating the reading practices of critical citizenship. Wilson was, after all, a school principal in Brooklyn at the time. By anchoring Ethiop's sketches in a seemingly disordered array of images, imaginary or otherwise, Wilson develops Ethiop's and his readers' taste for histories that are at once messy, filled with contradictions, false starts in the macabre, but also participatory, suggesting that the proper attitude of citizen to national history and symbols is the attitude of the critic to the work of art. As an overall work of fiction, the series represents a creative enterprise focused not just on exposure or suspicion that is uncovering ideological content, but also reparation and reparative reading, creating new, potentially more satisfying objects and restoring distorted or hidden histories. Critical citizenship reminds us that those excised from the national imaginary, those rendered absent from the body politic do not go away. We don't go away. The excluded, silenced, flattened, or forgotten haunt the spaces that attempt to exclude them, and their return can force a reckoning. Critical citizenship, then, is ultimately untimely and uncomfortable. From the perspective of those with investments in, in maintaining borders, its insistence in on openness can seem distasteful, divisive, intrusive. 
Indeed, as Frederick Douglass explains to a Chicago audience in 1854, he is, quote, not ashamed of being called an intruder because he claims a right to be here and a duty to perform. From the perspective of those viewing Douglas as an intruder, the status suggests a refusal to see him as belonging, as having a place. From the perspective of the intruder, intrusion becomes a position of power, an insistence on being present and the productive disruptions that insistent presence can create. 19th century black feminist activist, novelist, and poet, Frances Harper is even more explicit in her calls for parisia the practice of fearless truth-telling to those in power and against popular opinion. Speaking in 1875, five years after passage of the 15th Amendment, Harper would put the issue this way in a speech titled, The Great Problem to be Solved. Quote, with all of the victories and triumphs which freedom and justice have won in this country, I do not believe there is another civilized nation under heaven where there have so many people who have been brutally and shamefully murdered with or without impunity as in this republic within the last 10 years, and who cares? What cost is there to be paid, historian Martha Jones asks in Birthright Citizens, by a nation that permits people to work, create families, and build communities within its geopolitical borders, but then declines to extend the membership in the body politic? Here again, split roughly by roughly 140 years, we have questions that demand answers. Harper asked her question in 1875 after white violence handed an unreconstructed South a massive electoral win in 1874, called variously the Massacre of 1874 and the Coup of 1874. And the question remains unanswered in 2023. And yet, there is courage among us, Harper proclaims in Fancy Sketches published in 1859. Courage that has been thrillingly sublime amid the annals of the past. Have we ever had anything to exceed the courage of that Tennessee hero, for instance, who knew the plan of some of his fellow slaves to obtain their freedom, but rather than betray them, received 750 lashes and died? Oh, she writes, if I had children, the memory of this man would be stored up in their earliest recollections, and I would teach them to hate with a bitter, intense loathing the despotism that rushed out his life. This kind of education trusts children and the public in general to confront the, the enormity of the past and ongoing injustice and see in such an education not a blame-focused anti-patriotism, but rather the very definition of neighborly citizenship, a call to work that requires first and foremost a clear articulation of the problems to be solved, the systemic racism and sexism that created those problems, and a concomitant and a commitment to repair. Indeed, True patriotism, Martin Delaney argued in 1848, quote, consists not in a mere profession, not in a mere professed level country, nor simply the laws and political policy by which such country is governed, but an impartial love and desire for the promotion and elevation of every member of the body politic, the eligibility to all the rights and privileges of society. This and other than this, fails to establish the claims of true patriotism, end quote. I'm closing out. Recent initiatives like the Black Bibliography Project at Yale and Rutgers, the History of Black Writing at Kansas, the Black Self-Publishing Initiative at the American Antiquarian Society, the Color Conventions Project at Penn State and others are enhancing our understanding of how robust Black print and organizing were and continue to be. These projects are teaching us that simply adding black books and figures to the range of objects we take up is woefully insufficient. Black intellectual histories compel us to develop new methodologies, theoretical frameworks, and institutional structures. Understanding and learning from the wisdom and tactics articulated in black print is a matter of life and death for democracy in the United States and for black people, literally. As Kim Gallen argues in a recent essay titled what the mainstream news media can learn from the history of the black press, quote, the history of the black press reveals that speaking truth to power requires a more complex approach that depends on a commitment to not only routing out lies, but also combating injustice, end quote. This then is the premise of the citizenship practices my book outlines. Claiming citizenship is not an end point, but rather the start of a transformative collective process. 
As Douglas assured his audience in one of his final speeches, Lesson of the Hour, de delivered in 1894, recognized the fact that the rights of the humblest citizen are as worthy of protection as are those of the highest, and your problem will be solved. Thank you. Derek, thank you. It's fascinating. I love excluded history doesn't go away. Uh, and there's so much we need to do as historians, uh, as historians generally, as historians here at Monticello. I'm thinking about our Getting Word project, uh, finding histories that, that are there but maybe have been forgotten. Um, I'm hoping people have questions uh, for Derek. We are doing this live on st uh, live stream as well. So if you do have a question, please wait for the microphone. Uh, and afterwards, we will have an opportunity if you want to talk to Derek. He will be signing books. We are selling books uh, out in the courtyard. There'll be a small reception, and I'm sure that he'd be happy to sign a book uh, if you would like to purchase it and have a chat with you. But does anybody have a question immediately, or I will use the chair's prerogative to ask a question. Please. Thank you, Dr. Spires. There's, there's so much here. Um, as I was listening to your talk about the concept and evolution of the understanding of the individual citizenship, did you see or could you comment on, was there a parallel change in kind of the loyalty citizenship of the individuals from their state to the nation in the era of the Civil War? And the second part of that would be, is there a shifting of that loyalty from the nation to ideologies today. Thank you. Yeah, so one of the things I learned writing this book, very difficult to write rhetorically, is that the activists I'm writing on are constantly toggling between local, as in hyper-local Brooklyn, to state, to nation state, and even international confines. And so the 1840s, the state conventions happened in part because national organizing was just insufficient. Um, James McCune Smith, so black physician pharmacist will say that we're all operating under a different measure of oppression. And so black New Yorkers could vote with $250 in property, black Pennsylvanians could until 1838, and then they couldn't. So you need very different kinds of mobilizing strategies, very localized to make that happen. And at the same time, they were constantly appealing to this notion that we are American, right? We were born here and this is their language, not mine. We speak the language, we observe the religion, multi-generations, our fathers fought in the Revolutionary War. Um, you can see the citations here, like this is our home. And also, especially after the Fugitive Slave Act, and throughout this history, um, this is not quite what the book does, but throughout this history, there are folks saying, you know what? This place, it's home, but I actually want to be a citizen doing this thing. So why don't we look at Mexico, Haiti, Jamaica, Nicaragua, Central Africa, Canada, anywhere but here. As soon as the Civil War starts, people like Mary Ann Shad Carey, who advocated Canada, Martin Delaney, who advocated for Central Africa, Henry Highland Garnett, who was advocating for Jamaica, even Frederick Douglass, just before the Civil War, was looking at Haiti and had planned a trip. They all come back as soon as the Civil War starts. They're like, nope, all hands on deck. Douglass is lobbying for black soldiers. Mary Ann Shack Carey is in Detroit. Delaney is back getting commissioned, wearing his military uniform. And there's this bright and shining moment for about 10, 15 years or so, depending on which historian you ask where the, the America, right? Um, and then not so much. Throughout, they're holding to some notion of republicanism, like shared governance, representative democracy, the state, if we can get it right so that all the people are representing, this thing could work. Look at the South, right? The majority of black citizens in the South until the 20s and 30s were black. The stuff worked until the white folks said it couldn't. Yeah, so that's the, I hope that gets to your question. I'll ask a question. 
um, because I, I, I mean, you're covering so much and I need to read more of this and, and think about it, but I, I love the idea of, um, how do you, and I want to get the, the terms right, the practice of citizenship, the idea of neighborliness as citizenship, collectivity, uh, participatory politics, all of this, though, sounds to me as citizenship not only as a right but as a responsibility, uh, and that that was understood by the black press at the time. It also strikes me that there's potential tension in that, that it becomes possible to exclude people if citizenship is more than simply birthright. I, is there a tension in the 19th century? Is there a tension today? Always. Is that the professor's answer to every question? <laughs> that was too easy. It, there's always, no. So one of the things I look at, um, the first chapter is on Absalom Jones and Richard Allen's narrative of black Philadelphians who helped in the recovery efforts of, for the yellow fever epidemic. And they write directly in response to the official history which accuses black nurses of theft. Like, this is, you know, yellow fever epidemic, people are dying. Absalom Jones, Richard Allen, mobilized black community, supervised um, incarcerated people in a recovery effort, not unlike what happens in the wildfires in California or when we need to rapidly produce masks here. Right? It's what New York State did, right? They, they risked their lives. People died. After Richard Allen gets the fever and recovers. And the official history says, but some of these blacks, you know, and so they take that occasion to respond. And one of the things they forward using the parable of the Good Samaritan is an idea about citizen, the citizen as the Good Samaritan who doesn't love or approach the neighbor after they've shown their papers, right? The Good Samaritan loves the person under the assumption that they're already a neighbor. That's the principle, right? You don't wait to see, you don't wait to find out, you don't wait for them to prove I see you, neighbor. Hello, neighbor. Um, you build neighborhood that way. On the flip side, though, it, the way I end the chapter is to say we have to be very careful because one person's neighborliness becomes the other person's imperialism. Right? Um, William J. Wilson, in an essay titled, What Shall We Do With the White People? <laughs> in the Anglo-African magazine, accuses the United States of unneighborliness towards Mexico, like the US-Mexico war is key unneighborliness. And so the counter to neighborliness becoming imperialism is participatory politics, right? I see you neighbor, I will be neighborly towards you, but you get a say in the boundaries of what neighborliness means, right? And so there's this constant push pull of inclusion, but also getting a say. And I'm very upfront with saying citizenship sort of presupposes exclusion. It's no sort of pie in the sky version of this where there isn't an outside. It's all about how to manage that sort of with an eye, the way Douglas and Delaney say it, towards those who are least advantaged. Right? Any other thoughts? I see Gail looking at me pensively. Uh, other thoughts for Derek? I, it, do you, when you talk about this, um, as a historian, we're always, I think people are often too concerned about presentism. Um, I assume that this is just so obviously a present issue. Uh, do you get any pushback on that? No. I, I mean, part of it is, and maybe it's a good thing I'm a literary critic. <laughs> So I can come to historian spaces and say, oh, look, literature, I'm just doing the reading. But also, especially because when we start sort of drawing the lines, for instance, John Mercer Langston and his brother are activists in Ohio in the 1840s and 50s. Their grandson, Langston Hughes, is dealing with similar discriminatory practices in his life that they were in the state of Ohio. Like the history itself brings this stuff forward. Right? When the Ohio, when the Michigan folks make their argument about your, literally your knee is on our neck, I'm not the one bringing the present to that in 2020. <laughs> right? I don't have to make that giant leap of logic to say, hey, 
it, it sounds familiar. I'm just saying. I also am careful to say that, you know, we have to some degree made progress. Things change over time. And also one of the, I say this in a kind of physics sense, not in the sense of admiration. One of the beautiful things about white supremacy is that it's constantly malleable. It's constantly changing to fit the occasion, right? And so you get these bright and shiny moments like Reconstruction or the passage of the Civil Rights Act, and there's almost an immediate snapback. And you can see it play out again and again. It's almost laughably predictable. Uh, and uh, since I do revolutionary era, of course, if we're historians, we're all stuck to a particular era. The uh, same is true, of course, in the American Revolution. There's that bright and shining moment when we can actually imagine an America for all Americans. We can actually imagine a time when slavery will disappear. But by pick your date, 1800, 1805, 1806, we're seeing snapback. Quick um, note on that. The, so, um the black Pennsylvanians mobilize immediately once the once it's clear that Pennsylvania is going to disenfranchise them, and they cite debates from the Articles of Confederation. Like they're historians too, and they say, "Look, look." They actually debated whether or not to say citizenship is for white people only, and they decided not to. Right. So talk about bright and shiny moments. Right. This is before the federal constitution. They're saying, "Look, we we already did this. Why are we going backwards?" That was certainly the hope. Um, I don't want to keep people too long, and we're almost out of time in any case. Uh, one final chance if people have a public question. If not, I want to again thank Derek Inspires for joining us uh, and invite all of you to join us. We, I guess we have one more question before we go. The topic here, but I know my undergraduate school was very instrumental in formulating and forming my thoughts moving forward. So as you look back to Tugelo, what could you say was really instrumental for you from going to school there? Oh, I think, again, Jerry Ward was my undergraduate advisor from Tugelo, and he was the one who directed me to Dorothy Porter's work, like full stop. I also say it's a small HBCU in Mississippi, HBCU in Mississippi which provided a measure of protection. Like historically, Tugaloo College and other private HBCUs like it were havens during the civil rights movement. You could not come on that campus, right? And so there's a level of confidence, a level of comfort I had doing this work um, that I'm not sure other folks who went to other kinds of institutions were able to get in the same ways. Um, there were people who were very clear about their commitments to the work and why the work matters. And I carry that with me from the start, right? And also, even though I was finishing undergrad as a digital age was coming on, Tugaloo didn't have that. Hey, we had the bound indexes, we had the bound journals, we had the, so I learned by necessity to do research in a pre-digital context. And that also helped. Well, again, I hope you all will join us for the reception. Uh, you have an opportunity to buy the book, and said Derek will be happy to sign it. Uh, also, we will look forward to you joining us uh, as we continue to have events on Thursday. Uh, we're going to have a talk about Vermont, one of my favorite topics, but we're going to talk about Vermont and early America at the Fellows Forum, 4 o'clock on Thursday. We will be both virtual as well as at the library, if you can join us. And the next one of our book events here at the... Um, Theater. Uh, it will be August 24th with Lucia McMahon. We hope you'll join us for that as well. And we will be talking to Derek during the reception. So thank you all very much. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>